time but with our hands high our heart confident that our Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and alive in our hearts today blessed amen please tell their neighbor sitting right next to you tell them you are blessed so when they ask you how are you you will say i am blessed and we are all blessed amen so ngayon po ay sa ating day two at magsusimula ulit po ating lesson 
ipapagpatuloy po natin ang ating mga lessons simula kahapon. So, let's prepare our hearts and our minds as we listen to the Word of God and to the teaching na gagawin po sa oras na ito. Shall we all welcome Brother Stanley Yu? Amen? Yung mas malakas na palakpak para kay Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you all awake today? <laughs> yes, very early in the morning, right? So, you know, I was very, I was very excited when I was seated there because I don't know why in my spirit, man, there's some excitement because I know God is going to do something great today. Amen? So, I know you've been standing up and down for a while. Are you able to, shall we stand up again? We want to pray because you know the next three chapters is going to be very intense. It's going to talk about spiritual warfare. It's going to talk about divine healing. It's going to talk about deliverance. Amen? So let's believe that today, you know, whatever demons, whatever, whatever the demons trying to do is going to chase out. Yeah, it will be gone and we will live a victorious life. Amen? So before we start, let's pray in tongues because our tongue is so important. The tongue is a spiritual warfare that is able to help us. Yeah, to help us to get Satan away from us. So right now, let's pray. Let's pray in tongues. Let's keep on praying. Let's pray for one minute. Yeah, without the music, let's store our spirit man that's inside us. Amen? So let's pray right now. You pray, you pray. I stir your spirit man inside you. Let's pray like never before. Shidi Arabarabaraba Sukurabaraba Hai. Shidi Arabarabaraba Sidi Arabarabaraba. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we commit tonight, today's uh, sessions into your hands. Father, we believe and we store our spirit, man, that God, every demons will flee. Father, we are believing in the mighty name of Jesus, that God, we, together with you, that we are victorious in our life. That God, today, today, after the sessions, we will be set free in the mighty name of Jesus. So, Father, we pray for your presence again. Come and speak to our hearts. Anoint us, Lord, every single one of us here. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. You may take a seat. And every single time as we come, as we come and worship God, as we come, you know, in God's presence, we need to know that, we need to know that we also need to come in the presence by stirring our spirit, man. Amen? So, many of you, you know, you know that you are, you are doing every single time as we come, as we pray, that we know that God is going to do something great. Amen? God is going to do something great in your life. God is going to do something great in every single one of us here. Amen? So, let's believe. Let's believe. 
that today as we receive the Spirit, that God will be here with us as well. You know, as we start our Spirit today, we need to know that speaking in tongues are all different things. Sometimes we speak in tongues in a very soft manner because it's not a spiritual warfare. But your speaking in tongues, it must be in a different, different ways because when you are having a spiritual warfare, when you're fighting against the devil and you want to, you know, you want to have a warfare with the demons or with Satan, you need to speak like never before. You need to raise your voice. It is just like when you are doing something that's very intense, you need to be intense. Yeah, because you want to, you want to be pure, you want God to do something great. So in your spirit, man, we need to stir. We need to stir ourselves. The spirit man is in our belly. You need to stir your belly so that at the end of the day, the demons will flee. Amen? So there are different ways when we speak in tongues. Some way we quiet because when you're, when you're praying for one another, you do it silently. You do it together softly. You don't speak in tongues so loud. But when you have a spiritual warfare, we need to fight the battle. We need to take up the armor. We need to know that God is there. Amen? Yeah, we need to fight the battle together because God is with us. So today as we go into lesson four, are you there with your, speech? Are you there with your, with your notes? Okay, so let me go through. Huh? Right. So today we want to learn how to use our spiritual weapons that God has given to us to wage a victorious war not just for our personal lives, but also for our families and our church. As we have spiritual warfare, it's because we need to know something is going to happen. We cannot be afraid of the spiritual realm. We cannot be afraid because something is going to happen, we run away. The more that Satan tries to come and attack us, the, you know, the more victorious we will have because every, every attack is going to come victoriously. That as we fight the battle together, we will know at the end of the day, Jesus has reigned. We will know that we will definitely reign. You know, sometimes when, when, when pastor asks for new things, example, maybe your new building, there will be spiritual warfare. Because the demons doesn't want you, Satan doesn't want you to build a big church. Yeah, with a big church means many people will come to Christ. So there will be spiritual warfare. We need to fight the battle together with the church. Not just a family, but the church as well. So we fight the battle together because we are one. Amen? In the body of Christ. So today, we're going to read Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Ephesians 6 and verse 10. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Alright? Now, Verse 10, it says, my brethren. Okay, what do you mean by that? Friends, spiritual warfare is for all believers. It's for you and me. It's for everybody. It is not just for the pastors or your leaders. It's for us as believers. We need to take up the armor. We need to make sure that we know how to fight the battle together with our church, together with our pastors and your leaders as well. We cannot leave it only to the pastors on the stage. Friends, we need to fight the battle together because the Bible says, all my brethren, that is you and I as well. So all Christians are involved in direct or personal conflict with Satan. In verse 11, it says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the veils of the devil. So because of the nature of conflict, we had to put on the whole armor of God. Is in your notes, write it down. And friends, this is an obligation imposed upon every believer. That we are to put the whole armor of God so that when we fight the battle, every weapon come against us shall fall onto the ground. Jesus has already reigned. Amen? Has already gained the victory. In verse 12, in verse 12 it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So it's not about flesh and blood. It's not that I'm against you, that's why I fight the battle. 
it is about the principality of darkness. That as you fight the battle, you know that it's not for the person, it's not because you are against the person. You are just against the spiritual realm. And many times, when your friend asks you to pray for them, when they have a spiritual attack, we pray. We pray strong. You know, it's not about them. It's about the principality of darkness that we are praying against. So we need to pray strong and come with an armor so that whatever Satan tries to come against us, it will all fall off. Because we are holding the whole armor with us. Friends, the nature of warfare in verse 12 is like a wrestling match. A wrestling match. So, but it is not against persons with bodies. It is against the four spiritual realms. So, when we are fighting the battle, holding the whole armor of God, it is about the spiritual realms that we are having. So, number one, the spiritual realm of principalities. Write it down. Principalities. In Greek means arche. It's in your book. Which means Satan's appointed rulers over the nations of the earth. We need to pray like never before. You know, nowadays, the generations are very different. We were talking about it. I was talking to uh, uh, Joyce. And I was talking to some of them. I said, it's very different nowadays. The generation has a different mindset. Yeah? You know, they, because of the COVID, they listen and they watch a lot of YouTubes. And because they are so free, they don't just watch one YouTube of preaching. They watch many. And because they watch many, their minds are confused. And nowadays, the next generation start to come against it and question you. Why? Who say so? See, now against, now is the principality of darkness. We need to come against it. The next generation is the generation that's going to bring, that's going to bring people to the Lord. We need to pray against it together. You know, sometimes we say, oh, the youth will be the one that's taking over next time. But friends, do you know that as elders in a church, as, more, as older uh, Christians in a church, we have the responsibility. Your time is not over yet, guys. It's not over. I'm 51. My time is not over. No matter how old you are, they still need you. Need you for what? To pray for them. To be the armor bearer together with them. They are the next generation, but we, the, our generation, we need to pray. We need to intercede for them in the church and we need to intercede for them because they are the next generation. Amen? So all of us, we need to play a part. Without you, the older ones, how do they have the experience? So you guys will be the one with the experience we pray like never before. So every generation is needed in God's kingdom. So we need to know it's a wrestling match. It's against the principality of the powers, of the darkness itself. Secondly, number two, the second spiritual realm is a power. What is this power? The power in Greek means asiosia. Alright? It means dedicated power. Carrying out the commands of the principality. So this is a power of Satan that's carrying it out and doing it. Thirdly, number three, the third realm or the spiritual realm is the rulers of darkness. Rulers of darkness. Rulers of darkness in Greek means cosmocratoris. Cos, uh, cosmocratoris. Cratoris refers to the system of government or it means ideologies in the world. Alright? The ideologies, the rulers of the world is trying to flip over what Christian think it is. It's trying to flip over a lot of things. Nowadays, as I heard there's, there's, new, there's new religion that comes out that talking about the grace. Yeah, you, you, you are safe and forever you are safe. The Bible didn't say that. When you are safe, we still need to do and, make, and become more perfect. It doesn't mean that once you receive salvation, oh, I go back to the old lifestyle. No. You see, we still need to transform our lives. We still need to keep on going to perfection. Keep on doing what God wants us to do. And probably number four, the fourth spiritual realm is the wicked demons. The wicked demons. In Greek, means pornoria. Pornoria means the frontline demons that perform all the demonic and wicked actions in human lives. Yeah, the small, we call it the small Satan. That's going everywhere and destroying lives. Friends, the kingdom of Satan is an invisible spiritual kingdom, but it is very highly organized. 
efficient and centrally governed. Satan, remember, he is a fallen angel. He used to be from heaven. But because of his pride, he fell. So as Christians, we cannot just leave it as it is. Many of us, because of our personality, we are very quiet. And we like it because we will tell the devil, oh, you don't touch me, I don't touch you, huh? Don't disturb me, okay? I just live a life like that, okay? No, it's not okay. The devil doesn't come, we should go and storm hell. Amen? Because we need to storm. We need to come and spirit, have the spiritual battle all the time. We cannot just leave Satan alone. We need to storm hell all the time. So that when Satan tries to be funny, he will be out of our way. So friends, we cannot just live life as mediocre. You know, we once said, we once said before, that when you wake up in the morning, what would Satan do? Would Satan be very afraid? Oh, you know, a bishop tap is away. Oh, he's going to plan another church. Oh, let's, get, let's do something. Or would Satan just say, ah, this person, don't worry. He will not harm me. Don't worry. What do you want? Do you want the devil to be always afraid of you? That every single time as you wake up, you're going to do something great for the Lord. That the devil is so afraid of you. Yeah, that keep on wanting to attack you, but cannot because you are protected by the Lord. This is how we want to storm hell. We don't want Satan to wake, to, you know, to, to, to say we are no harm to their kingdom. We want to destroy it. Amen? We want to claim that whatever that has been lost in the human nature, in the human kind. So we need to storm it all the time. We cannot just leave it alone. Friends, while the kingdom of God, while the kingdom of God is con governed by love, the kingdom of darkness is controlled by fear. Many people, or some of them, are very fearful of the spiritual realm. They are not just about the spiritual darkness. They are even, still, they are even afraid of the Holy Spirit. You'll be very shocked. You know, sometimes when you move in the spirit, they get very scared. They will say that, oh, I'm, I'm scared of spiritual. I don't dare to touch. But it's the Holy Spirit. This spirit is holy. It's different from the rest. So you need to take up the Holy Spirit in you and fight the battle together. Contrary to many popular opinions, Satan is not confined to hell or Hades. In your book, it says, in fact, he does not even reside on the surface of the earth. His headquarters are in the heavenlies. In verse 13, if in verse 13, the Bible says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you might, may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. So the Bible is telling us that we take the whole armor of God, we storm hell, we storm the principality of darkness, and as long as we have done everything, we can stand before the Lord. We can stand and say we have done all, God, and that's it. See, friends, the armor of God does not drop onto our lap. We are not born with and it does not grow on us. We have the obligation to take on the whole armor of God by a decisive act of the will. We need to take the whole armor of God. That's why I just now I ask you to pray in tongues for one minute. It's because we're having a spiritual warfare. When you have a spiritual warfare, your speaking in tongues cannot be quiet. When you are praying with your friend, you don't shout because your friend, your, your friend's eardrum will, will break. When you are praying with your tongues, you speak softly. You speak softly. But when you have a spiritual warfare, you shout. You shout like never before. You shout. You shout. You speak in tongues with a loud voice because you are having a spiritual warfare. You stir up your spirit man. It's not because you are shouting, you are stirring up your spirit man inside you because the spirit man is in the valley. That stir before you. So friends, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 4. The Bible says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So we have mighty spiritual weapons. They are able to pull down every demonic stronghold in our lives every demonic. So we have these spiritual weapons that we can come against Satan, against the principality of darkness. In verse 5, it says, casting, casting down arguments 
and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So, however, in the book, it says the battlefield is not external or physical. Remember, it's not against the person. It is not against one another. It is against the spirituality of the principality of darkness. So the battlefield is primarily the human mind through our imaginations, our reasoning, our speculations, our thoughts, and our knowledge. Sometimes we use our mind more than we use our heart. We use our mind too much that we thought that it's like that. We should use our heart because God looks at your heart. God sees your heart in everything that you do. It's not just our mindset, but our heart must be right with God. So true, captiv captivating the minds of men, Satan seeks to dominate the whole entire human race. Yeah, it's true, captivating, captivating, captivating the minds of men. So our responsibility is to liberate the minds of men from Satan's dominion and bring them back into the obedience of Christ. You tell your mind that you cannot do that. You tell your mind that you need to change and transform. You tell your mind to change the whole thing that is wrong with you. You need to tell your mind to do that. Don't allow the mind to do anything else. You know, we always say that the idle mind is a, is, is a devil's workshop. When you have nothing to do, your mind gets to a lot of funny things. So what can you do if you have nothing to do? Speak to your leader and your pastor and serve in church. Because when you serve in church, there's a lot of things you can do. Yeah, you'll be so busy that you will not have an idle mind. So we cannot allow our mind to be idle. Because when the mind is idle, the, the Satan will come in into your mind and change the whole thing about what you think. That's the reason why during COVID, many of us, we are being stuck at home. Yeah, we have this lockdown that we cannot go anywhere. So when you are locked down and you cannot go anywhere, what is the next thing you do? You watch the internet. You go to YouTube. And that's where all the idle minds, everything all fill into our mind because we've got nothing to do. And that will poison our mind. You see, we need to know what we want to receive in our mindset. What do we want? Every single time, it is not wrong to listen to different sermons. It is not wrong to listen to sermons after preachers after preachers. But you need to make sure your mind is right, your heart is right. Every scripture that the pastor preaches will always coincide together with the sermon, with the, with the Bible itself. You need to confirm with the Bible whether is it true. Amen? So then you will know whether is the doctrine right or wrong. So you have to be very careful, friends. Christians are the most significant people on earth. Because we alone have the weapons needed to do the job. Satan is very afraid of us. Yeah, as we all take up the armor of God, we are fighting the battle together. And that's where the devil will stop us. And he wants to stop us all the time. He doesn't want your church to be growing. He wants to stop it. But if your church is growing, the more you get, remember, you know, Pastor Kong always, he told us this thing. Small church, small problem. Big church, Big problem. Why? Because as your church is growing bigger, more people want to come. And more people come in, they have a different mindset. We need to disciple them. So leaders, pastors, you need to do discipleship. When they come in, they are not perfect. When they come in, they need discipleship. That's the reason why they need the Lord. See, they come in, they need you to disciple them and tell them what to do. What is right and what is wrong. So as Christians, as leaders, as, 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 a, as a member that's long time in the church, you need to hold on to your DNA. You need to know what you need to fight for. Amen? Don't allow outsiders to come in and destroy every unity that you have in the church. Because that's where the devil will come. The Bible says, the Bible says that there are people who will come in in a wolf in sheepskin. Yeah? Wolf in sheepskin. That means they will come in and destroy the unity of the self of the cell group of the church. So you have to be very careful. You know, once upon a time, my, I mean, as my cell group was growing, every single time, there will always be new friends that come. And they want to attend the cell group. 
And every time, the devil will plant somebody to be funny in the cell group and try to destroy the unity, try to destroy every single time. You know, as my cell group grows as well, there are all the different people, very funny attitude. At times, I have to tell them, please stop coming to my cell group, you may attend the service. You know, there was one time, there was one of the new friends. He, she called the church and said that she wants to attend a cell group. So she wants to attend the area that I, my cell group is in. So what happened is that she came the first week. And when she came the first week, after, after the cell group meeting, my member told me they got so afraid of her because when we are doing the praise and worship, she folded her arms and she looked at the person doing worship. Stare at the person when he was worshipping. So my members got, wor- got scared because they were worshipping with their hands lifted up, suddenly their eyes opened a little bit. They saw this woman staring at them. I did not believe her. Frankly, I did not. I said, how can it be? Where got such people? So the second week, she came again. The second week, you know what she did? When she came to my cell group, because it's my house, it used to be in my house, she went to my kitchen and opened all my cupboard. <laughs> my helper got so worried. My helper came and said, so, 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 so. The lady opened all the cupboard and see what's inside. I said, huh? <laughs> Quite funny, right? Then when she, when my member tried to be very nice with her, she asked my member, what, is, what, do, you work, what do you work as? Secondly, how much is your salary? <laughs> so, that is fine, okay? Then the second week, in a place of worship, she also stared. She stared at my member as a worshipping, with her eyes open up. So I got so, I got so shocked. Then my second member told me also. So I didn't believe. Like again, Peter denied Jesus three times. <laughs> so the third time, you know what I did? When, I, when everybody was worshipping, I wanted to experience it. I opened my eyes. I looked at her. She was staring at me like that. I'm supported. You know what I did? I stared at her, she stared at me. I, put, <laughs> I used my finger. Close your eyes. <laughs> She got so shocked. She knew that I'm staring at her. I put my finger like that. She closed her eyes. We were arms folded. And that's not all. That's not all. So she is not saved yet. So one day, Pastor asked for altar call. The same woman, huh? altar call. She raised up her hands. My member was so excited. Bring her down to the altar call. After the prayer, she walked up to the aisle. She looked at my member. Why you ask me to go down? My member shot, no, no, no. You, you lifted up your hands. He said, no, I believe in all gods, you know. Not just your God. I believe in all gods. Then my member asked me, hey, Stanley, not me, you know, I didn't rush her down. She wanted to lift her hands. So at the end of the day, I told her, I said, sister, you know, you can come to church because church is open for everybody. No issue. But please don't come for cell group because you believe all God. A cell group is a place that's very close connected. We only believe one God. And because we believe, we are committed to one God. So if you believe in many gods, no point coming to a cell group. Why don't you receive salvation first? You attend service. Don't come to the cell group. And then after that, when you are convicted, then you come to the cell group. You know what she told me? No, I still want to come. <laughs> so as pastorally, I try to be very pastoral. I try to tell her, no, it's okay, sister. Never mind. We still love you, you know. You come service, we still love you. We will still fellowship with you. She said, no, I will want to come. Again, Peter denied Jesus three times. <laughs> the third time I said, no, sister, don't come. No, I will want to come. I turned at her, no, you don't come. <laughs> because this is my house. You cannot come into my house. <laughs> so eventually, she didn't come and she said, I'm going to email the Pastor Kong. I said, sure, I give you the email address. You see, there are people like that. They try to destroy their unity, try to put fear in a cell group, in the church. We need to be very careful. You need to protect your sheep. Amen? Everything that you, you need to protect because the devil is trying to come and destroy every single thing that you have done. Especially when your group is growing. Especially when the church is growing. Satan is not going to fold his arm and say, Oh, hallelujah. Never. He's always on the attack. That's why we need to be on the attack all the time. We need to carry the weapons and be aware of what the, the, the Satan is doing. We need to be aware and keep, and keep Satan out from us. Amen? So friends, base, the basics of spiritual warfare. What is the basis of spiritual warfare? 
Let's go back to your book. On the cross, Jesus Christ had finally and totally defeated Satan once and for all. Amen? And Satan is not going to be defeated. He has already been defeated. So now, let's be very clear that Satan is a defeated foe. Let's not be afraid of what Satan tried to come against you. He can throw fairy darts at you, but you will still stand because you have the protection from the Lord. Amen? In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15, shall we read together? One, two, three. Amen? So through the work of the cross, Jesus Christ has dethroned Satan and his demons. Dethroned it totally. So let's not be afraid of what the devil is trying to do. Amen? Can you turn to your neighbor and tell them, say, Jesus has won the victory. Amen? So, he can harass you, he can oppress you. Remember, he can come and steal and kill and destroy your life. But if we are ignorant of our new authority in Christ, friends, we will allow the devil to come and destroy our life. We need to be aware what Satan is doing. We need to be aware in your spiritual realm. If you don't feel good, you know that it's not good. You need to make sure you get out of it. You know, many times we always pray. We pray and pray. We pray a lot, I believe so. And when we pray, sometimes when we want to do certain things, we don't feel the peace. Our heart don't feel right. Your heart is not excited. You feel something is not right. So when you feel something is not right, you do not have the peace. Don't do it. Because the Holy Spirit is telling you, no. See, sometimes in our life, we try to, we try to be God. We try to be God ourselves. Because we like to do it, we will say, oh, this is what the Lord tells me. But many times, our feeling is always wrong. See, you need to seek different advices from, different, from leaders, from pastors in the church to confirm and double confirm what you are going to do. Sometimes our mind will be the one that controls us. So we need to be very careful in what we are doing in the kingdom of God. So therefore, we must now exercise the authority over the kingdom of darkness. We must take up the authority over it. So in the spiritual warfare, our real purpose is not to defeat him. Our real purpose is to administrate that defeat. That means we don't need to come and say that, oh, we want to destroy Satan. Remember, Satan is already been destroyed. Amen? Our mindset is to take back what the Lord has given to us. What the demon has taken away, we will take it back. Amen? We don't come with a defeated mindset. Because Jesus has won the victory already. In Colossians chapter 2, there are three things given in our logical succession. Colossians 2 and verse 13. Okay, write it down. The Bible says, And you, taking dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made a lie together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So all your sins has, have been forgiven. He has forgiven everything already. So don't live in a condemnation mind. Don't live in condemnation at all. He has already forgiven you. As long as we are not fully assured of our forgiveness, there will always be a measure of guilt inside us. So when you pray for forgiveness, and it's already been given to you by the Lord Jesus, means you have been forgiven. Don't live with the guilt anymore. Yeah? Jesus has already forgiven you. Satan's greatest weapon against us is always guilt. The guilt and always say, you are no good. Call yourself a Christian. Yeah, remember what you have done last time? You think God will forgive you? You need to tell the devil, get behind me because my Lord has already forgiven you. So that, the, so that Satan won't come near you at all. Amen? Friends, in verse 14, the Bible says, Colossians 2 and verse 14, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having near it to the cross. So, secondly, number two, all condemnation has, has been removed. All condemnation has been removed. You are no more condemned. Jesus has forgiven you. Friends, while well, the law is good, the law has no power to save you. We need to still follow the law. We need to follow the commandments. 
But this commandment doesn't save us. It's only through the Lord Jesus Christ that's able to save us. We follow the law so that the law, so that whatever we do, we need to know as a Christian, how should we live with? How should we live together? So the law gives us a knowledge of sin and show us how far we have fallen from the glory of God. The law reminds us of how condemned we all are. Friends, as long as you are in any measure of condemnation, you cannot live a spirit-filled life of liberty, peace, and joy. If you are always condemning yourself that you are no good, that I should not be born here, then you cannot live a spirit-filled life. The Holy Spirit is spirit filled inside us. It is always stirring our spirit man inside us. So as you live in victory, that's where you know that the joy of the Lord is your strength. That when you have the joy inside you, nobody can take it away. The demon try to come and attack you, you will tell the demon flee. You will tell the demon to go. Because you have the joy. You have the joy that's inside you, within you, that nobody can take it away. Amen? So friends, Satan accuses us day and night on, of how we have broken God's law and deserve to be condemned. Every now and then, if the root of the problem is not get rid of, then you will forever come back to the root of the problem. So you need to be honest to yourself. You know, many times people do not get out of uh, spiritual warfare it's because their root is not out yet. When their root is not out, it's very difficult to live a spiritual life. You need to be honest to yourself so that whatever the roots has been growing, you need to pluck it out. Amen? You need to pluck it out. I have a member who told me with a revelation. You know, he says, Stanley, you know that as the tree grows, right, we are the living, we are the tree. And as the tree grows, around the tree, there are always weeds. You know, the weeds that's growing around it. And many times, you know, if you're a farmer, you will know by plucking out the weeds, it doesn't help. Because when you pluck out the weeds, the weeds will start growing again. So in order to get rid of the, re of the weeds, what do you do? You need to burn it. So what does it say about our life? The weeds are those that's condemnation, are those people that's against you. So what do you need to do to get rid of it? You need to be on fire for God. So when you're on fire, the weeds around you will be gone, will be burned away. It will not come near you at all. So the weeds of condemnation, the weeds of struggles, the weeds that's stopping you from doing what God wants you to do, you need to be on fire to burn it up. So all the time, you need to come with a victorious life and live with, on fire for God. Yeah, anytime that anybody asks you to do anything, your pastor asks you, you say, yes, I'm the first one to go. I'm on fire for God. When praise and worship come, you're on fire, you dance, you praise. Yeah, when during cell group, you come every single time. For the last 27 years as a Christian, I've never ever missed cell group meetings. Unless I'm overseas for a mission trip like this. I never miss. Because every single time I come for service, I will always think that he's talking about me. So we, have, we must always make sure that our learning ground is always there. We will not stop learning until the day we go back to heaven. You know, many times people come to church when they are not willing to be teachable, they will always say, oh, this sermon... You know, pastor is talking about, he's talking about my neighbor, not me. <laughs> yeah? But you need to know, even though if pastor is preaching the same thing in and out, but he's still speaking to your life. Amen? So you need to know, we need to transform and change our life. So get the weeds away from you. You be, need to be on fire, on fire for God, so that the fire that's inside you will not be consumed, but the fire that's inside you will keep on burning. Then every time you are sent forth to do mission work, every time you are sent forth to do the Word of God, to send forth to teach the people, you see, that's where the fire of God will come and keep on burning inside you. So friends, it's through the cross we need to know there is no more condemnation for us who are in Christ. No more condemnation. Condemnation has been removed. Amen? In Col Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15, it says, Having disarmed principalities, number 3, and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So, number three, Satan is now being disarmed. He is disarmed. Every Christian must know that through the cross, Satan has been stripped of his weapons. 
Satan has no weapon against you. The only weapon he has is accusation. Ac accuse you all the time. So when Satan tries to accuse you, you tell Satan to get behind you. You need to take up the whole armor and fight against it. Because condemnation is not from the Lord. Amen? Every Christian must know that through the cross, Satan has to be stripped off. We are the ones with the weapons and not the devil. We are the ones. So friends, we are dealing with an enemy who has only one trick. What is that trick? It's to bluff you all the time. It's to bluff you and say you're no good. It's to bluff you to say you're too old to serve the Lord. Yeah, it's to bluff you, oh, your generation is over. Let the new generation take over. Who says so? The Bible didn't say so. Moses served God until the rest of his life. At 100 years old, he still can do the miracles of God. Who says so? We are not 100 years old yet. We can still serve the Lord. Amen? In our own capacity. Maybe we cannot serve as much as what we used to serve in the younger days. But it's okay. You are still serving the Lord. Amen? Don't let the devil stop you or bluff you from thinking that you are no good. So today, we're going to read about the armor of God. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14, Okay, it's not in your notes. Shall we turn to it? Ephesians 6 and verse 14. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14. Are you there? 14 to 17. Is it there? Oh, yes, there is. Okay. So, verse 14. Stand therefore, having girded with your uh, ways with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And verse 15. And having showed your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery dust of the wicked ones, and verse 40, uh, 17, and take the whole helm, helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Amen? So this is the whole armor of God that we are supposed to have. So verse 14, it says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, so the first one, what is the waist? The waist which is the belt of truth. The belt of truth. Alright? Now, in the whole armor, all of them are defensive. The only one that can attack is your sword. The sword of the spirit. So we have a lot of defensive armor that we are wearing. Friends, don't need to worry about Satan. Yeah, we are all having defensive in our life. In the Bible times, the belt which is girded around the waist held the soldiers' garments together so that they will not hamper their movement while marching or engaging in a combat. So the, the, the waist of truth, it is girded around you so that as you fight the battle, you are you make sure you are being uh, uh, chastened properly. So that as you fight, your pants don't drop down. As you fight, the weapon don't come out. So the, that's the that's waist of truth. So in our Christian life, this belt is true. Okay, write it down. So the spiritual significance is that God does not simply want us to point at the truth. He wants us to wear it and have it wrapped around us. Yeah, the truth that's around our waist. Not only does the belt hold everything in place, but it also serves to carry the shield that holds the sword of the Spirit for ready access. That means this belt will have the sword, will have everything that's around it, so that you are able to come and fight the battle. You know, in number two, second part of Ephesians 6 and verse 14, it says, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So number two is the breastplate of righteousness. All right? So what is the breastplate of righteousness? Number two. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet and the hope of salvation. So the Bible says, let us be sober. That means to be aware. Friends, another word it says, don't be blur. You need to be aware what you are doing as you take on the breastplate of righteousness. So as a believer, we have, to, we have to live in truth, speak the truth, be genuine, 
be honest to others and not cover up and not put on a religious or super spiritual front. Let us be right with God, with every single one of us. So the breastplate of righteousness means the breastplate of faith and hope. When we put, put on the breastplate of righteousness, it is the faith and hope. So the breastplate is right in front of us. Every time the weapon try, accusation try to come, it's always about the truth and love that you have. When it comes and attack you on your, on your breast, you have the breastplate to protect you. It will all fall down to the ground. It will not hurt you at all. So the righteousness that overcomes the devil is not one that comes by our good works. Alright? In Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. Shall we read together? One, two, three. Amen. So the righteousness which is from God by faith. So it's our faith that made us well. So the righteousness you receive by faith. When we understand the love of God that demonstrated through the cross of Jesus Christ, you know that you are not condemned because of the great love of God. Amen. You know you are not condemned. You know you are righteous. You are justified by faith because of the work on the cross. You are justified by faith. So don't let Satan to come and accuse you with a weapon that tries to come against you because you are putting on the breastplate of righteousness in you, the armor of God. Also, true faith in your book, it says, always works through love. You know, Jesus is not, Jesus is, his, Jesus' word is spelled as L-O-V-E because Jesus is love. Every time you think of Jesus, it's always love. You know, I told my cell group members, sometimes my cell group members come and ask me, Stanley, what should I do to this person? You know, or what should I do in my situation? How should I counsel this person? I always tell my member, you should counsel as though Jesus is here. As though you are Jesus. What would you do if you are Jesus? Would you condemn the person? How do you counsel? You counsel as though you are Jesus, you are standing here. You know, Jesus is full of love. So when you do that, if you think if Jesus is here, what would Jesus do? And that's how you can counsel the person. Sometimes we come, we rough. We get very angry with our member because they always, you keep on telling them to do the right thing, they always do the wrong thing. Yeah? And sometimes when they do the wrong thing already, they will come to you, Stanley, how? You know, as leaders, we feel like telling them, I already told you, right? <laughs> but you cannot because if not, they'll be more condemned. So pastor already will say, hmm. Let me pray for you. But deep in your heart. So sometimes when I go, I want to, you know, I want to scold a member. I say, I really told you. Why you do that? But as you come with anger, before you even go, you pray. You ask the Holy Spirit to lead you. And trust me, when you reach the person, your anger will be gone. As you keep on praying, and when you reach the person, as you speak, there will be no more anger. Because in your mind, you will want to think what to say. Am I right? Yeah, when, when, when you want to see the person, your mind is really telling you what you want to tell the person. What you want to tell the person. How angry you are. What you want to tell the person. Why you do that? You know, why this, why this, why this? But as you walk and you pray, suddenly, when you meet the person, it is going to be the same thing, but the person don't feel mad at you. Because when, at the end of the day, you speak with love. See, that's where the person can feel it in their heart. So friends, it's always coming with love. True faith always works through love. Yeah, that's one of the, that's, 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 the, that's the thing that we need to have. Love is always the one. Galatians 5 and verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. And that's the reason why we need to have the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is to be more like Jesus. Yeah, and you notice that the fruit of the Spirit, the first fruit you need to have is love. And when you have the first fruit of love, any other fruits, you can overcome. And there's a reason why you notice that the fruit of the Spirit, the first is love, the last is self-control. Because when you have the love, joy, peace, long-suffering, you have, you, have, you have thanksgiving, you have faithfulness, at the end of the day, when you have all these eight fruits, self-control is not a problem. You have overcome it already. That's why the self-control is the end. 
You know, sometimes we have anger problem. Yeah, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, we have anger problem. Or we have this problem. Then we always say, God, I cannot control myself. God, teach me how to self-control. Then God will tell you, you must have the flow of the Spirit. Because the Bible always have every single line is always right. That means when God put love first, means we need to have love first. We cannot go and change the whole term. You cannot change the whole thing that God has placed. If not, God will put self-control first. So many times we want God to do it the fast way. That's why when we pray, we will always say, God, I pray for this and I want it now. Our God is not a fast food restaurant. He does His will, not upon our will. So when you want to have self-control, you need to have the first, all the eight fruits before you need to have self-control. Because once you have all the fruits of the Spirit, self-control is the last one. There is no issue at all. At the end of the day, people will see you are a transformed person. Amen? So friends, number three, Ephesians 6 and verse 15. Ephesians 6 and verse 15, the Bible says, And having showed your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And what is this? The shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace. Alright, so this is a shoe that you are wearing. So the Roman legions were famous for walking very long distances. Alright, it's written in your book. They could march under pressure for a long time. The secret is in their boots. A Roman soldier had leather boots which firmly wrapped up the whole calf itself. When the army was in a state of emergency, the soldiers would all sleep with their boots on. Preparation is the best defense. So every single time, we need to prepare everything that we want to do. We cannot leave it to the last minute. But in the last minute, once we have prepared, and during the time when God wants to move, we allow God to move. We cannot put God in a we cannot put God in we cannot put God in, 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 in a box because our God is not in a box. When the Holy Spirit wants to move, we allow the Holy Spirit to move. So similarly, in our spiritual, in our Christian warfare, we must be ever ready to share the gospel all the time. We must be able to be ready to share. And friends, can I tell you, sharing the gospel is not just about the word of God. When you share the gospel, most importantly, you need to share the testimony that God has given you. Do you know that with your testimony, it's easier to get people to come to church? You don't take the Bible to go and do street evangelism and tell them, oh, my friend, you know, what will you, where will you go when you die? You don't receive God, you will go to hell. Nobody will listen to you. But as you go out to your friend, you share about God's goodness. Your friend wants to know, who is this God that you're serving? I want to come to your church. I want to know you. I used to have a member who migrated to Australia. She only know God for three months. But her, 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 whole, her whole feature is, is so demure, is so nice, that anybody will be attracted to her like a maniac. You know, every single time, there was one time when she was sitting at, a, at our train, at our train going, on, going to work. She was sitting down there reading the Bible. Suddenly, someone come to her and ask you, Sister, are you reading a Bible? And this, and this person haven't received Christ yet. And he was asking her, Oh, you are reading? What are you reading? Huh? So when she explained everything, and at the end of the day, this girl asked her, or my, my member asked her, Do you want to receive Jesus? And she said, Yes, in the train station, inside the train. Her feature is so, her feature is so nice and so amicable that people want to come near to her. Attraction. You see, your testimony is the best to show people who God is. So every single time, we need to have testimony after testimony of God's goodness in your life. Amen? Because our God is alive. Every week, you must have testimony. You must share a good thing about God. Small or big, it doesn't matter. Yeah, God is not despising any small or big breakthroughs that you have. So every small thing you have, you share. Because as you share, you are proclaiming God's goodness in your life. So people around you will be blessed with your sharing. So let's share testimony about God's goodness. Friends, the gospel is a gospel of peace. Therefore, in your book, we must be ready to transmit the peace of God into every environment that our feet tread upon. Every environment. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, it's talking to you. Let's read together. Ready? One, two, three.
Amen. So the Bible says, in the exclamation mark, preach the word. You know, some of us, we are very scared to preach the word because we don't know whether we preach the right thing or wrong. That's why I say, preach the word. It's not just the word of God, but preach and tell people about the goodness of God. Amen. Preach about it. Know the word of God even more. Read the Bible and have the Holy Spirit to work together with you. Because at the end of the day, every single time where you meet the people, it's the Holy Spirit that stirs inside you. You must always find friends to come and bring them to church all the time. And the Bible says, be ready in season or out of season. That means be ready all the time. In my cell group, we have prayer meeting. So members will come for prayer meeting. And every single time I pray meeting, I have different people to pray. So some of them, of course, you know, when they don't dare to pray, they don't dare to come. <laughs> they don't dare to come earlier. But after a while, they get used to it. So I make them pray. In season, out of season. Sometimes they come very tired. They look very beaten up. I, I, I took the mic. I say, let's pray. The person has to pray. Even though it's a short prayer, it doesn't matter. You, you be ready in and out of season. You be ready to fight the battle every single time. Because, you know, when you are weak, that's where the devil will come and destroy you. So even though we are weak at certain time, we need to take up the armor. We need to be ready every single time to fight the battle together with the Lord. And the Bible says, convince as thought, rebuke as thought, and with all suffering and teaching. Which means whether you like it or not, you need to make sure that you need to rebuke when it's not right. We are, I, 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 I members, I, people will tell me, that, oh, Stanley, I'm, 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 I don't like like that. I don't like confrontational. You know, I don't like this, I don't like that. But you see, friends, when you rebuke somebody, it's not scolding the person. Remember, it's all about principality of darkness. That means if the person is not right in the Word of God, you need to tell the person, hey, don't do that. Hey, it's not right. You cannot keep quiet about it because you know it's not right. And when the person do a wrong thing, you need to stop the person from doing it. See, sometimes we, very, we are very scared because we, when we tell the person we may lose this member. But friends, it's not about losing the members or your friends. It's that true friends, true, true friends will tell true things. And sometimes true things will hurt. But it's okay because you, are, you want the person to be good. You want the person to, to have a great life in the Lord. So we cannot keep quiet when we know that we are supposed to rebuild at certain times. Because remember, as you are rebuilding, you are rebuilding not the person is in the spiritual realm. So the person will change and transform. That's the main purpose. Amen? So you need to know what you are going to do. You cannot keep quiet when you know that it's not right with the Lord. Especially when it's the Bible, it says so. Amen? For instance, somebody will come and tell you a lie. Maybe it's not a big lie, it's a small lie. You know, they will say, oh, I'm just joking. You must be right. Hey, don't joke this kind of thing. Because in God, right, there's no white lie. There's no such thing as black lie or white lie. A lie means a lie. So you tell the person, hey, don't joke like that. It's not, it's not good. You see? So you need to confront the person and tell and rebuke the person. Don't do that. Amen? Alright? So friends, in number 4, Ephesians 6 and verse 16, the Bible says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fairy dust of the wicked one. So number 4 is a shield of faith. So above all, it means in the midst of all pressure, trials, and tribulation. So a Roman soldier, what would they do? They use, they, use, they use a long over shield to cover their whole body. So for a believer, this shield is called the shield of faith to cover you. Friends, faith can protect us completely and we are going to need this complete protection in our warfare with the devil. We need the shield to cover us. Because every single time, the devil will throw fairy dust on you. What is this fairy dust? Fairy dust of accusation. You need to take the shoe and keep it so that the fairy dust will not come near you. Every time the fairy dust tries to come near you, your shoe is there and you will drop onto the ground. It will not come near you at all. Friends, the total protection and provision of God are all in the Word. We need to dig up the promises in the Scripture and turn our faith loose through, through them. Our faith needs to rise up like never before. We need to fight the battle together because our faith, all of us, we need to rise up. Friends, the shield will be strapped around the Roman soldier's arm very firmly 
So, you know why it must be go around very firmly? You know when they fight, they don't just use the shield? The shield is on the left. If you are right-hander, your right-hander is the sword. So as they are fighting, the shield is to protect the enemy from attacking. So when they are fighting, they take away the shield, they, are, they fight with the sword. So every single time, as you take away the shield and fight with the sword, that's where the devil will come accused, and that's where you use the shield to block again. So every single time, the shield is to protect you from all what Satan has done. So you have to strike your faith so firmly onto the Word of God that it will not slip in, in, in any emergency at all. That the shield, the devil will not have any gaps to come in between at all. You know what the devil will do? The devil will always find gaps, uh, the small gaps that you think is okay, to come in and, and kill still and destroy your life. This small, this small gap. Because the small gap that you allow the devil to come in, after a while it becomes bigger and bigger. And subconsciously, you will think that it's okay. Subconsciously, it gets bigger and bigger and that's where you start to backslide. For example, okay, what kind of seed of hole would you have? Example, maybe you have a new job and you've been praying for your new job. So this new job gives you a good salary. You've been praying for it and you went for interview and you got the job. Of course, we will sing praise, right? Hallelujah, God gave me a job. But the job says, you need to go overseas, you need to do this. You know, you cannot come Sunday service for maybe, um, uh, you can only come one month once for Sunday service. But in your heart, you want the job. Because why? You lost your job. And now you have this job, you say that it's from God. And, you, and, and to you, it's like, oh, it's okay lah. Pastoral will understand. self group leader will understand, right? I got no job now, I got my job. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. I only come, you know, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still Christian, what? I only come to service for um, once uh, every month. You know, it's okay, don't worry. You know, don't worry, leader, I'm okay. You think it's okay? <laughs> yeah? You think it's okay? It doesn't make sense that when the Lord bless you with a job and keep you away from His house, it doesn't make sense at all. Sometimes our mindset tells us it's okay. But slowly, surely, you do that for a few months, slowly, bit by bit, that once a month will become no more because the job that you are in, you have more commitment. And then you will say, it's okay. Pastor understands. You know, pastor is very nice. Love, right? Love. Mm, love. You know, pastor give us love, right? Love. You know, pastor will not score his love. You know, pastor will want me to have, to have job, right? I know job. It's very difficult. No. This is not right. Because if God opened the door, He will not stop you. He will not shut the door of heaven upon you. If God opened the door for you in that job, that you will begin to be more committed to the Lord. So slowly, surely, this is a gap that you are allowing the devil to come in and destroy your life. And I guarantee you, one year later, you'll be gone in the in Lord's kingdom. You will say that, never mind, don't attend church, it's okay. I attend online service, What? I also attend online, right? Yeah, hallelujah. Attend online is different from attend on site, right? Or how, how many of us have experienced during COVID time? You know, I actually I love online service. You know why? I was telling my member I love it. Because 10 a.m. service, I don't need to wake up at 8 a.m. Yeah, 10 a.m. service, I wake up at 9.55 a.m. <laughs> 9.55, oh, wake up. Oh, service, five minutes. I on the, I on the TV. Because it's on YouTube, right? I on the TV. I'm ready, go and brush my teeth. Five minutes. Oh, after that, you brush your teeth, right? When we are brushing, oh, the service started already. Praise and worship. Oh, you come out. Oh, praise and worship. Hallelujah. But you are sitting down there, you don't praise and worship. After the praise, a little bit of praise, a little bit of worship, you say, hmm, I want to go to the toilet. <laughs> yeah? Ah, I know. I also experienced that. After going to the toilet, oh, I want to eat breakfast, drink coffee. Drink coffee while having praise and worship. Can you imagine? <laughs> you see, how to worship God like that? How to worship? So surely, after a while, you will think that online service is okay. I'm still with the Lord, what? No, it is not okay. It is about gathering in the house of God. That's why we need to come together. So surely, don't allow the devil to sip in every single time. If you are without job right now, you have to pray that the job will allow you you know, God will give you a job that's so good that you're able to attend cell group and service at the same time. That you will have your increment. 
you will have your bonus. You will have a higher pay than before. This is how our God works. Amen? If God were to bless you with that job, God will not put you away from the house of God. Amen? So you need to understand that. Don't allow the devil to come and kill, steal, and destroy your life. You are having an eternal life that you need to have. Amen? Alright, so number five. What is number five? In verse 17, the Bible says, And take the helmet of salvation. So the fifth one is the helmet of salvation. Alright, write it down. A helmet is for the protection of the head. That is the mind of the, of the taught life. Alright, the taught life. Hyper. In Proverbs 23 verse 7, the Bible says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Whatever you think in your heart, and that is who you are. And friends, to be a victorious Christian, our mind must be protected from all doubts, from all unbelief, from all fears, and from all depression. Yeah, you need to get rid of it. Reminding, re retain, retraining your mind is a matter of discipline. It's a matter of discipline. And this will not happen instantly. You have to make a strong decision to put on this helmet of salvation. You need to put on this helmet all the time. You know, during a lot of times, uh, our, our mental well-being is very, very important. Don't allow depression to come into your mind at all. And can I tell you, we all know that when you let into depression, no any doctors can help you. Depression cannot help by having, your, having medicine for you because the medicine is only to dull your mind. The medicine cannot stop you from depression. You need to tell yourself you need to get out of it. You need to wear the helmet of salvation all the time to protect your mind. Your mental health is very important. You know, during COVID time, a lot, even in Singapore, a lot of people committed suicide because they cannot stand being kept in a house. They cannot stand being doing nothing. And that's where the idle mind will come in. So you need to have the helmet of salvation all the time to protect you, that Jesus will protect you all the time. So allow the depression to go off. Tell yourself that you're in, 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 Lord, in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you will not have depression at all. Because, can I tell you, no amount of medicine can help you at all. There is no cure. Only Jesus can cure you. Amen? The medicine that a depression takes is only to dull the mind and nothing else. If you keep on thinking too much about condemning yourself, then there's nothing much anybody can do. So you need to come before the Lord and discipline your mind that it is okay. Friends, this will not happen instantly. You have to have a strong position to put on the helmet of salvation. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 8, the Bible says, And as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So the helmet is hope. Helmet is hope. Hope means a confident expectation of good things to come, which means you are to have an attitude of optimism. You need to be someone who is optimistic every single time. Optimistic in everything that you do. You cannot be passive. Passive will not help you. You need to tell yourself that you are the head and not the tail above and not beneath. That God has put you here for a purpose in life. You know, you may not be better than the person beside you, but it's okay. God has created you your way. Has created you to be unique. You have your own talent. You have your own gift. That you have your own thing that you can do. So always have optimism in your mind. Don't be too passive and think, think of all the negative thoughts because negativism is not from the Lord. So you need to take away. Now, sometimes for a person who is always negative, right? I'm, I'm someone who is very optimistic. You know, no matter what happens, I will still run on. Yeah, no matter what, I will still go on. I will always be very optimistic. As I will have this logo to say, I can do it. You know, Nike, just do it. I always have this. I'm very optimistic. But people who are very passive, every single time you ask them to do something, the first thing they will say, cannot. Yeah, cannot. First thing, because their mind is always very negative. Their mind always thinks they cannot do it. So your mind, you must change from like that to become like that. Amen? Tell yourself that you can. Because being passive is not able to help you in your life. So you need to transform your attitude to be the right attitude. 
In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, the Bible says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. You are called according to His purpose. So everything will work out well for you. Friends, if you love God and, walk, and are walking in His calling and purpose, you can afford to be an optimist. Yeah, you can have this slogan to say, everything in anything, I can do it. Your slogan, I can do it. Even though it takes time, you still can do it. Amen? You can do, you can run a cell group, you can, your cell group will grow, your spiritual life will grow. You can do it. Therefore, we must cultivate a positive mental attitude, a confident expectation of good in every situation. Everything is good. You know what's about? Because I'm an optimistic. I'm, a opti I'm, I'm, I'm someone who is very optimistic. So many years ago, my pastor asked me in my cell group, and I was, my cell group was smaller, around 20 people. So I look around at my cell group member, because every year, my pastor will always ask me, who is going to be your next leader? Even before your, your cell group grow, who is going to be your next leader? You need to train them every single time. Because in City Harvest, to train a cell group leader, it takes three years. Three years to train a cell group leader. So, I look around my cell group, any of them, I don't see any potential. I don't see. So, I tell my pastor, I don't have, or cannot make it. So, my, you know, my pastor, the, my pastor, when my pastor told me this thing, I was shocked. My pastor said, you choose the, man, the best among the worst. The best among the worst. I said, oh, like that also can. Huh? <laughs> choose the best among the worst. That means when you look around yourself, you think that, hey, all this cannot be leader, cannot, cannot. Who say cannot? They are of God. So I really choose the best among the worst. In the end, the best among the worst can become the best. Amen? <laughs> they can become. Because sometimes our mindset will tell us this one cannot, that one cannot, that one cannot, cannot, cannot. But you see, when you give them the responsibility and when they have a touch of God, everything also can be done. Amen? So you need to change your mindset to think that it is possible. Friends, some of you are born and brought up as a pessimist, always on the lookout for the negative, you need to renew your mind. So today, let us quickly summarize the five items of your spiritual warfare. Alright, let's summarize. What is it? Firstly, next one. Alright, so let's look at the picture. Yes. You want to write it down? The first one is the belt of truth. You are walking in truth. Secondly, is the breastplate of righteousness, which is the faith and love. The shoes of preparation of the gospel of peace. The shoe of faith, which is the faith in God's promises, and the helmet of salvation, which is the hope in God. Alright? Okay, now, you notice that out of the six armor that you have, five of them are defensive. Five defensive. The five are this. Okay, out of this. The five are the, the belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, shoes of preparation, the shoe of faith, and the helmet of salvation. Okay, remember, you are on guard. You haven't attacked yet. Alright, you haven't attacked. So, why is there there are five defensive? Because God is trying to tell us that in everything you do, don't worry. That every, every fairy dust that come to come, try to come against you, it will be bounced out. Because you have five defensive weapons that you have. So the next one, if we have finished this, we're going to look at the weapon. So when you are defending yourself, now attack. That we are to attack. We cannot defend all the time. Many of us, we know, as a soccer match, you cannot be the defensive line, right? You need a striker or two strikers to attack. So now is our time to attack back. So the fifth one, that is a weapon of attack. And what is it? In Philippians chapter, in Ephesians, sorry, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17, the Bible says, it's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So numbers, firstly, what is a weapon? Write it down. The Word of God is a weapon. The Word of God is a weapon. Now, so, the Word of God is a sword of the Spirit. For the first time, we are passing out of what's purely defensive into the aggressive. We are defending all the time, but now we are attacked. We cannot just be defensive and let the devil come and destroy us. We need to attack back. We need to knock on hell's, hell's door and knock onto the devil and try to and get him out of it. So, friends, 
You can only be aggressive with your enemy when you have a sword. Everything, your shield cannot help you to, to, to attack your enemy. Satan will do anything he can to keep you from taking up and, and welding the sword of the Spirit because you will become a, rain, a real danger to him. You will destroy him. He doesn't want you to take up the sword of the Spirit. And that's the reason why you notice, I wonder how many of you, you notice that. Every time you try, okay, when you want to read any other book, you, you, your, eyes will, your eyes will wake up. Especially when you watch TV. K-drama. Oh, you watch the show. Oh, you can watch hours after hours. You notice that when you read the Bible, you read for two minutes, you want to sleep. <laughs> oh, I caught you. <laughs> yeah? yeah, you notice that. <laughs> so the spirit of slumber will come upon you. Every time you try to read the word, you... <gasps> It doesn't help that when you, when, you, when you try to read the Bible on your bed. Yeah, you want to fall asleep. That's why the devil is trying to attack you. To make you stop reading the Bible. But you can read storybooks, many books after many books. And you are not tired. Why? Because the devil doesn't want you to read the Word of God. Amen. The, the, and and, and I, I like nowadays the technology. That we read from our handphone. Because there's a Bible app. So if you cannot read from the book, you read from the app. Because many of us, we are advanced. Many of us, we don't take the hard copy of the Bible, which is fine. But you need to read the Word of God all the time when you're sitting on the tri tricycle or when you're going to work. Read it. Don't keep on surfing on the Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Yeah? Read the Bible. Read from that. Because do you know that when you read from the app, you'll be very shocked that as you finish reading, you read finish many chapters. Because it's very fast. So, learn to change the habit of reading the Bible in the app. Since now, the new technology like that. Yeah, we don't go back to the old. But of course, if you can read from the hardcover, it's fine. But if not, you read from the app, the Bible app that you have. Amen? So that you are still reading the Word of God. Friends, in Greek, there are two words for the word. First one is called the Logos word. The second one is called the Rhema word. Okay, we need to have the Logos and the Rhema word. What do you mean by Logos? In the book it says, Logos is the general truth, the general counsel, which is the word of God, which is the Bible. Rhema word is a specific word spoken to you on a particular situation. So there's a difference. Now, we need both. We need the Logos, we need the Rhema. You cannot have the Logos and not the Rhema. When you are in the Holy Spirit, especially when you speak in tongues, when you are in the Holy Spirit, your own, so you need to make sure that whatever you receive from the Lord, your Rhema word, you need to confirm with the Logos word. So that you know whatever that is speaking to you is not of your mind, but is of God. Amen? Every single time when you receive a word from God, the Rhema word, it must always be positive. Don't receive any negative because negativism is not from the Lord. So you need to confirm with the word. So the word of God in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 is called the rhema spoken word. And the word will become your sword when you speak it. When you know the verse, you speak it. When you say, I'm the head and not the tail above and not believe, that I believe that nothing is impossible for God, you are speaking the word of God. You need to go and fight the battle with the word of God. Now, many people will only want the Rema because they are very lazy to read the Word. But friends, can I tell you that with the Rema Word, you don't know the Word of God. How are you able to know to fight the battle? You see, the Rema Word is from God and it's from the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit will speak to you. The Holy Spirit will want to confirm with you the Word of God as well. And can I tell you that many of you, you may know that God doesn't speak in a long sentence. Yeah? He will only speak one word. Sometimes you try to figure out what is the word that God is trying to say. You know, you pray, God, God, you know, give me this, God, you know, I pray that you, I, I will do well in my business and all. And when you pray, God give you a word. Be patient. Like, you're asking yourself, patient in what? Find the word. Find the Lord God's word. What do you mean by patient? What do you mean by long suffering? Find the word of God. And then from there, you confirm the word of God. See, remember, 
God doesn't come in a long sentence. God doesn't talk to you in a conversation. He come with one or two words and that's it. So for you to confirm that word, you need to go back to the Bible. What is the word of God says? So we need to read the Bible. That means if you don't have, if you don't read the Bible, you don't know the word. Even if the Rayman word come to you, you still don't know. So how are you able to have a breakthrough in your life? So remember, every word proceed from the mouth is always from the Lord. Friends, the perfect example is Jesus. Jesus uh, confronting Satan in the wilderness. All right, in Matthew chapter four, verse four. Say the Bible says, but he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus also said, It's written in the Bible, you know, Satan. What are you trying to do? And verse 7, Jesus said to him again, It is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So Jesus knows the word of God. And there's a reason why for that 30 years of his of Jesus' life, he did not serve ministry yet. He went to the temple to learn the word of God. He only went out and served and know that he's a man of God at only for, at the age of 30 years old. He only served the Lord for three and a half years. So at, from, from the day that he was born until 30 years old, he was always in the temple learning the word of God. Can you imagine? He doesn't say, oh, I know the word. Okay, I'm going to go out at 18 years old. I'm going to conquer the world. He doesn't. He still needs to remain there and read the Word of God and study the Word of God. Then from there, he's sure. And that's where he went to launch out and do his ministry. And his ministry lasted for three and a half years. You see, friends, we cannot be lazy in the Word of God. You know, throughout the years, uh, during the COVID, throughout the years until now, there are many people try to be a prophet. Try to be a prophet. You know, there's a lot of prophetic that's happening. They try to be a prophet without knowing the word. How are you able to? You know, you always speak the word of God, but when you speak the word of God, you are not confirming with the word. You don't even know the Bible. How are you able to be a prophet? How are, how are you able to be a prophetic? How is the prophetic word able to come up from your mouth? We cannot have the shortcut. If you don't know the word, how are you able to minister to people? You need to know the word. We need to study the Word. And that's the reason why you are here. Amen? You are here to study the Word. So every single time you can take up the weapon and say, God, I know the Word. I'm sure of the Word. So anytime the devil come and destroy you, you will, you will tell the devil to get behind you because you know the Word of God. You are sure that Jesus is there for you. So this is the Word that you need to have. And verse 10, he says, Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. Again, what did Jesus say? For it is written. He also confirmed me the word that you shall worship the Lord your God and Him only you shall serve. So Jesus mentioned three times. It is written, it is written, it is written. And because He confirmed me the word of God, Satan had to back off. Had to back off. When we confirm with the word of God, Satan will get off from your life. So you need the word of God. When you speak the word of God aloud by faith, it becomes a powerful sword out of your mouth that Satan doesn't dare to come near you because Satan knows that you love God a lot, that you study the Word. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, is in your book. The Bible says, He had in His right hand seven stars. Out of His mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and His countenance was like the sun shining in His, shield, in his strength. So the Word that come out from His mouth like a double-edged sword, that will pierce through every single heart. That as you speak the word of God, the person's life will be transformed and changed because that's the word says. Again, friends, we see that Jesus, the reason Christ, is using the two-edged sword of the Spirit. And you notice that the sharp two-edged sword came out of us from his mouth. So it's your mouth that is so important. The word that you confirm is so important. You need to speak the word of God. When I was a younger Christian, before I became a, a self-group leader, what I do is that to, un, to know the Word of God because, you know, for me, I, I don't really like reading. I'm the, one that, I'm the one that I told you, I read for two minutes in the Bible, I'm like, oh, I want to sleep already. <laughs> so what did I do? Every single time I read the Word, right, I will always, whatever word that pops up on me, I will write down. I'll type it out. That single verse, 
Then I will cut it. I will cut out that piece of paper. I'll paste it on the wall. So every word, every verse that pop up on me, I will paste. I will paste. So every day I come back, I go back to my room. I will read the word, and it's a short word. So I confirm with the word of God every single time, because I'm I'm someone who doesn't like to read books. I don't. But after when I become Christ and become a leader, I need to know that I need to read more. So I have to push myself to do it. So in order to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, I need to paste the verses off. I need to use the Word of God as a sword of the Spirit. That any of the negativism try to come into my mind, I will use the Word of God because it's pasted in my bedroom. It's in my room already. So same goes to you. Because sometimes the Bible can be so taunting there is so many things to remember, right? So you just need to remember certain verses that will help you destroy the devil. Paste it there. I even, I used to have a cubicle in my, last time before I, be, I do my business, I used to have an office and I'll paste it in the office as well. So I go to work, I read it. I come back home, I read it. So every single time, I confirm the word of God. See, that is how you confirm it. So you must think of the way how you're going to do it better. Think of ways how you're going to bring the Word of God into your life. In Isaiah 55, verse 11. Okay, shall we read together? One, two, three. He shall not return to me void. Amen. So every word that you speak will not come back to you void. Will not drop onto the ground. That every word from you will accomplish what you say. That's the one that we want. Friends, if you notice that it is not just God's word that cannot fail. It is God's word out of God's mouth that cannot fail. It is out of God's mouth that it cannot fail. Friends, and God desires that every believer like you and I to become his mouthpiece. We are to speak the word of God. When the Holy Spirit energizes us to speak his word, it will be as effective as and authoritative as if God Himself has spoken. Every time you speak the Word of God, it is as though that God is speaking through you because you are confirm, confirming the Word of God. Amen? So friends, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17, it's talking about the spiritual tongues. It says, which is the Word of God. So, number, se- number two is sp- supernatural tongues. Okay, write it down. Supernatural tongues. So, right after Paul spoke about the sword of the Spirit, he talked about praying in the Spirit. And that's why we have a one minute of prayer. We pray in the Spirit. Your spirit man must be strong to fight the battle. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 2. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to man but to God. For no one understands him, however, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. So when you speak in tongues, you're speaking to the Lord. Even Satan doesn't understand what you're talking about. You're speaking to God directly. Now the Bible is very clearly defines praying in the spirit as praying in supernatural tongues. Alright? The tongue that you are praying, can I tell you, don't, I mean, we, we, don't get, we, we don't get so eerie about it. You know the tongue that you're speaking is actually other languages. That you are speaking. You may not know suddenly your tongues when this native comes and says, hey, how come you know how to speak my language? You know, in Bible school, I, uh, I was in Bible school and one of the, one of the, ma- one of the Bible school students during my time, he came from China and he was actually one of the uh, China person who doesn't speak English at all. So when he speaks to my, 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 my SOT mate, he was telling, we are speaking in Chinese all the time. All right, and then during one of the sessions of speaking in tongues, suddenly he was speaking very loudly. We all turned to him. After that, when the session has finished, we asked him, Hey, you bluff us. How can you lie? You know how to speak English? He said, No, I don't know. He speaks in Chinese, I don't know. But I said, You just spoke in English. So his tongue was English tongue. And you know that we told Pastor, and Pastor asked him to come up to the stage. And he spoke in tongues and he was speaking in English. So friends, your tongue is not something that you, you think that is, 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 is created. It's not. It is a language that some native is speaking. So speaking in tongues is just a language. 
you want to be strong in the tongues, you need to speak and speak again. It is just like when we learn a new language. In order to be more fluent in the language, we need to keep on speaking. Keep on talking about it. Keep on speaking in tongues, even wherever you go. I remember the first time when I received the tongue. I was very shy because I don't know what I'm talking about. So when I went back home, in the toilet, I was speaking, I was trying out. So I tried and I practiced. Of course, in the beginning, it was very, very short. After that, every time I go to the bathroom, I will spend 30 minutes in the bathroom. Until I speak so loudly, my mom knocked on the door. Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> how come there's another language? I said, oh, no, no, nothing, nothing. So that's how I speak. And then you get better and better. And can I tell you, the Bible says that your tongue will change. Why your tongue will change? Because you, get, you become more fluent. When you speak a language and you become more fluent, your language becomes different. And as you speak in tongues, the power of God will come from the tongue. Because as you speak, people will get healed. As you speak, people will get delivered. As you speak, the joy will come. See, that's how speaking in tongues is. It's so important. Friends, the Bible very clearly defines praying in the Spirit as praying in supernatural tongues. In verse 14, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14, verse 14 and 15, the Bible says, For if I pray in the tongue, my spirit prays, and my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding as well. So as you are praying in the Spirit, it's different from praying with understanding. It's very different. All right? Also, praying in the Spirit is a decision that you make. Four times, Paul says, I will. I will do it. All right? Now, once you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you can pray or sing in tongues whenever you choose to. You must learn to sing a love song to God. Singing in tongues is singing a love song to Him. Amen? It's like all of us. I don't know how many of you love K-drama. How many of you love K-pop? My daughter loves BTS. So being a young parent, I also need to love it together with them. So I also let her watch BTS concert. I also watch K-drama. But if you notice that, you know, some of us, we will say that, how can I sing? I don't understand the language. But again, how are you able to sing K-pop when you don't know the language also? <laughs> yeah. It's because you like it, right? So same. Speaking in tongues is the same. You must love speaking in tongues. Even though you don't know, just sing a love song. A love song that comes up. A love song that comes from your heart to sing out to Him in tongues. See, this is a song that God is looking for. Friends, many people... Many people who don't speak in tongues think that the tongue is nothing but just an em emotionalism. They will think that we are in an ecstasy. But the truth of the matter, can I tell you that tongue has nothing to do with our feelings. It is the decision of our will. Do we want to speak it? Do we want to get better and better in speaking in tongues? Because in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, the Bible says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, and the Spirit gave them utterance. So friends, it is the normal talking, except that you are speaking in a spiritual language that you did not learn from anyone. It is a spiritual language you need to know. It is the Holy Spirit who is giving you the words to speak. Holy Spirit that speaks through you. That's the tongue that you have. It is going to require you to speak out in faith. You need to speak from the belly out. Sometimes our mouth cannot talk. You need to open your mouth. Because out of the belly flows the river of water. The river of life. It flows out. Friends, it is going to require us to have faith. Because what? Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. You need to speak in faith. In Jude chapter 20 and verse 21, it says, But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, Verse 21, keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So praying the Spirit will build our faith. You know, sometimes when we are down and out, we cannot pray in words because we feel very sad already. We feel very down. How to pray in words? Sometimes when we feel so down, we cannot even praise God. Am I right? Let's be very real. You know, sometimes we say, oh, we try to praise, but we cannot. That's where you will speak in tongues and build your faith up. 
From there, as you speak in tongues, the more you speak, the better your faith will rise up. And that's where you can speak the word of God. See, you build yourself up in the spirit. And if you want to keep yourself in the love of God, tongues is an absolute necessity. You need to learn to speak in tongues even more. You need to speak a fluent tongue in yourself. Friends, learn to pray in tongues all day long. In your shower, in your car, wherever you are. You know, but of course, in your public transport, you don't speak so loudly. Lah. You know, people beside you think you're crazy. Yeah, you speak in tongues every time that you can. In your office, when there's nobody around, you speak in tongues. Or when you're alone, as you're walking, you speak softly to yourself, you speak in tongues. So that you get more, you, you, you get more affluent, so that your, your tongues will be better and better and better. And when you do that, every time you come to church, you speak loudly. You don't care about your neighbor beside you. The neighbor doesn't want to speak. That's their problem. You speak to God. You know, every time I worship God, I told my member, I'm, I'm, I'm actually tone deaf. I'm tone deaf. You know, last time I used to lead a cell group. When I lead a cell group, basically, when the guitar play, I cannot come in. I just anyhow come in. I don't care. Then my wife will go and feel it back again. You know, every time I come in wrong, wrongly, you know, I still can continue singing because I'm tone deaf. Then after a while, my wife will come in, okay, try to tone down, tone back again, and come back to the right tune. I don't care. You know, I sing, I don't sing very well because I, I, I mean, I cannot sing. I try to play guitar. You know, one time I try to play guitar and sing at the same time. I, I try very hard to be a good self-group leader. I play the guitar. When I play, right, I try to practice. I keep on practicing. I cannot sing. I, I play the song G chord. I play, play, play. I cannot come out. I cannot, cannot, comp cannot synchronize. Finally, I tell myself, no, I'm not talented in singing and playing. I told my guitar, I passed to my member, I said, there you go, you go and learn. I tell myself I cannot. But it doesn't matter, even I sing and croak like a frog, I don't care. I told my member, whoever that doesn't want to stand beside me, you go somewhere and stand. I'm singing to the Lord, not singing to you. So if you think that I don't sing well, it doesn't matter. Because my God thinks that I sing well. Amen? So you sing to the Lord. You pray to the Lord. You speak in tongues louder than anybody else. That's how you speak because Paul says, I speak more in tongues than anybody else. That we are supposed to speak in tongues even more. Keep on speaking and keep on stirring your spirit man that's inside you. Friends, the power, the skill, and the wisdom to use the weapons of warfare are provided when you pray in the Holy Spirit. When you pray in the Holy Spirit, it will be there for you. Number three is the blood of Jesus. Okay, write it down, the blood of Jesus. All right, the blood of Jesus. Revelation 12, verse 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the sword of the Spirit of the testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So there are three things mentioned in the above verse. What is it? Verse number one, the blood of the Lamb. Write it down, the blood of the Lamb. Secondly, the word of God. And thirdly, is the personal testimony of the believers. So if you put all these three together, in a very practical way, we must testify personally to what the Word of God says about what the blood of Jesus does. We need to practice it, we need to say it. And friends, I told you many times, without your personal testimony, the blood remains ineffective. You cannot be, you cannot Share the word of God without your testimony. People look at you and know who God is to you. Amen? Because they see there's a breakthrough in you. They will see there's a change in you because you are with the Lord. Friends, it is our testifying that makes the blood so powerful, spiritual weapon as against Satan. Satan doesn't want you to go through the test. And when he wants you to go through the test, he makes sure that you fail your test. Fail very badly. But friends, can I tell you, many of us, when we go through struggles and challenges, we always pray, God, get me out of this trouble, get me out of these struggles, get me out of these challenges. But can I tell you that God will never let you get out of the trouble? Because the Lord Jesus will be in the boat with you. He will not bring you out because He will go alongside with you. Because if every single time He saves you out of your struggles and, 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 and challenges, you will not grow. He wants you to grow. 
So He will go alongside with you. He will not leave you in a lurch. So at the end of the day, when you go through your challenges and you have a breakthrough, and that's where you can share your testimony about God's goodness. So when you pray, ask God. Say, God, if you can bring, you know, let this cup pass me by. Let this cup pass me by. But Jesus will be there with you. Pray for Jesus to be alongside with you all the time. Remember, whatever struggles and challenges you face, if God knows that you cannot handle, He will not give it to you. He knows that you are able to handle it. And once you handle it, and you become an overcomer, and that's where you share such a great story of testimony. So God wants you to have a great testimony for Him. Therefore, we must speak out of what the Bible says about the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. The power of the blood. Firstly, what does the blood do? The blood brings redemption. The blood brings redemption. Alright? So, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Shall we read together? 1, 2, 3. Amen? We have redemption through His blood. Next one, Psalm 107, verse 2. Let's read together. 1, 2, 3. Amen. So we are redeemed out of the hand of the devil. You are redeemed. Hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, say, you are redeemed. Amen. We are redeemed. But friends, it is effective only when we say so. Only be effective when you say yes and amen to it. Amen. So you need to know that you have been redeemed from the sin. You have been redeemed by Jesus' blood. So, Today, why don't we say, I want you all to say together with me very loudly. One, two, three. Let's say together. Through the blood of Jesus. Okay, let's try again. One, two, three. Through the blood of Jesus. I am redeemed out of the hand of the devil. And all of God's people say, Amen. You are redeemed. So live a life of liberty. Live a life of freedom. You have been redeemed. Amen? Don't live a life of condemnation anymore. The blood of Jesus has redeemed you. Secondly, the blood brings forgiveness of sins. The blood gives forgiveness of sins. So, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. So, redemption is tightly linked to forgiveness. Incomplete forgiveness provides incomplete redemption. That's to say, like I told you yesterday, you cannot say, I forgive you, but I'll not forget what you have done. That is half forgiveness. You need to forgive and forget to have complete redemption in your life. So when you forgive and forget other people, remember Jesus has forgiven and forget, forgotten about what you have done. So that's where the redemption will come. Friends, we only have the full legal right of redemption as far as our sins are forgiven. As far as our sins are forgiven. Amen? So thirdly, the blood brings cleansing from all sin. Cleansing from all sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Cleanses us totally. So if you notice, there's three things that are very in, uh, in interrelated. What is it? Firstly, walking in the light. Secondly, fellowshipping with one another. Thirdly, cleansing from all sin. So fellowshipping one another is very, very important. Friends, the evidence that we are walking in the light is having fellowship with one another. You notice that people who are very, always want to be alone, doesn't want to fellowship especially during the COVID time and after the COVID, there are youth, there are young people who doesn't want to come back to church. They became very awkward. They became socially awkward. They used to be very lively. But because of the COVID, when they gathered together, they became socially awkward. They don't like to talk. So we need to bring them back and fellowship because fellowshipping with one another is a community we need to have. It's a community of every single one that we can pray for one another. The purpose of fellowshipping is to pray for one another. 
The purpose of fellowshipping is to help one another. That's the purpose of fellowshipping. So you need, I need you, you need me as well. So we need one another to come together. Because friends, the closer we have fellowship, the brighter the light and vice versa. When you begin to fellowship, people will understand and, and, and they can pray for you. Friends, the blood cleanses only in the light. Only in the light. Amen? So, shall we say together, the blood of Jesus is cleansing me now and continually from all sin. Everything cleanses you totally out. So, learn to fellowship one another. Learn to come. You know, for my cell group, after my, 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 our service is 10 to 12. But I told my member, if you want to be in my cell group, Sunday service is from 10 to 2. They will say, why? How come? It's because 10 to 12 is service, 12 to 2 o'clock is lunch fellowship. If you cannot do that, don't come to my cell group. So everybody knows, after 12 o'clock, you need to go for lunch fellowship. Because you see, you must know, people doesn't like to come with lunch fellowship. We were somehow forgotten about this person. See, out of sight, out of mind. So how are you going to pray for this person? How are you going to get to know about this person? So every time, we will always go to the same food court, you know, the food place that we eat, every single week for the last 20 years, we've been going to the same place at the same time. So that every one of us, every several group members would know and they bring their friend to the same place. We don't need to correspond with one another where to meet. We go to a place that's reasonable, so in any other, anybody can afford to go and eat together. We don't go to a special restaurant because there are certain people who may not be, may, may be, may not be able to afford a certain restaurant. So we will go to one place that everybody can afford and for the last 22 years, we've been going to the same place. 22 years. I know, I told them, I know the food is very terrible. 22 years, I close my eyes, I know what I'm going to eat. The store is the same for the last 22 years. But it's not about the food. It's about fellowship. Amen? It's about talking to one another. I told my member, it's okay. If one man wants, you want to go somewhere and eat with your family, I have no problem. It's okay. But every single time, let's be there. Because when we are there, we fellowship, we pray for one another. We fellowship, and that's where, you see, you eat together, you stay together. And that's where I, I thank God. Because during the COVID, none of my members left the church. None of them left the cell group because we are still united. You know, during the COVID, it's so funny. We cannot fellowship. We cannot, we cannot go out, right? So what we did, we have a Zoom lunch. So after service at 12 o'clock, I will tell all of them, okay, every week we will log in at 12.30 and then we will eat lunch our own, at our own house. Then we turn on the Zoom and we eat lunch and we talk. So all of us will be on Around 60 to 70 of us will be on the Zoom and we fellowship. Whoever want to talk, unmute themselves and we talk. We fellowship like that. So for the last three years of COVID, we've been doing that every single week. And that's where it makes it easy. It makes it easier for us when after the COVID, we can gather together again. We are so happy to come back together because we are doing it every single week. Amen? So this is how fellowship is so important because the closer we fellowship one another, the closer we are to God. Because remember, God didn't create Adam only. God created Adam and Eve. God loves fellowship. God wants all of you. He wants you to fellowship as well. So friends, don't be an island. Don't be alone. Because the more you fellowship, the more presence of God will be with you every single time. Because the Bible says, as two or three gather together, He is in the midst. So when you are gathering, God is there for you. God is in the midst together with you. Amen? Thirdly, uh, fourthly, sorry, number four, the blood brings justification. The blood brings justification. Justification means to be made righteous. When I am justified, God looks at me just as if I had never sinned. In Romans 5 verse 9, the Bible says, much, much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. We shall be saved from wrath to Him. Amen? So let's testify aloud together right now. Through the blood of Jesus. Okay, let's try again. Through the blood of Jesus. I am justified. Made righteous. 
just as if I had never sinned. Amen. You are made righteous by Jesus' blood. Amen. You are made righteous. You are where God has made you to be more righteous. The next one, the blood brings sanctification. The blood brings sanctification. So to be sanctified is to be made holy, set apart to God. Hebrews 13 verse 12, the Bible says, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So you are sanctified because he might sanctify the people with his own blood. So you will set yourself apart wholly to the Lord. Okay, let's say this together. Through the blood of Jesus, I am sanctified, made holy, set apart to God. You need to have sanctification in your life. You need to know when to say no to people who try to stop you from coming to church. From people who start to stop you from doing things that's right. So you need to be sanctified and set yourself apart to have sanctification in your life. Number four, that is the name of Jesus. Okay, the weapons of attack is the name of Jesus. Amen? Matthew 16, verse 15. Okay, verse 15 to 18. Let me read to you. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every create, uh, creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Verse 17, And these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons and they will speak with new tongues. So you are a new creation. You will cast out demons and you will speak with new tongues. And lastly, verse 18, they will take up serpents and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Amen? They will. See, the Bible didn't say that only pastors and leaders can do that. The, the, the Bible says that all of us, we can cast out demons. We can make holy. All of us can do that. Amen? We have the power, we have the weapon, we have the blood of Jesus to do that. So every promise of God's release only, uh, is released only by the name of Jesus. Forgiveness, healing, deliverance is by the authority name of Jesus that's where deliverance will happen. Friends, the authority is in the name of Jesus. So the name of Jesus is a weapon that will cast out all demons. So the name of Jesus is very, very important. That's why the Bible says, do not use my name in vain. Because the name of Jesus is so great. Many times we will say, oh my God. No, no, don't use God's name in vain. You can say, oh my gosh. Yeah, we always have this thing, we'll say, oh my God, no. If you say, oh my God, what is wrong with your God? So don't use that anymore because you are using God's name in vain. Or you will say, oh my. So don't use God's name in vain. In Mark 16, verse 17, the Bible says, it's written here. Shall we read together? One, two, three. Amen. How many of us, how many of us are believers here? Raise up your hands. Amen. How many of us are believers? Yes. So the Bible says, for all who believe, you can cast out demons. As long as you believe, demons will, be, will flee from you. Amen. Will flee from every time you pray. Deliverance will happen. Healing will happen as well. Friends, the name of Jesus is a weapon that heals the sick. In Acts 3 verse 16, the Bible says, And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So the name of Jesus is a weapon that also brings salvation. Amen? It's the name of Jesus. Romans 10 verse 13 is written in your word. Let's read together. One, two, three. Amen. Whoever calls upon the name of Jesus, upon the Lord shall be saved. As long as you call upon the Lord, salvation shall come to your place. Friends, therefore, we see that the name of Jesus is a powerful weapon against the devil. When God dedicates something to us, we are made responsible for it. You are responsible for everything. If we don't use the name of Jesus with faith, nothing will happen. We need to use the name of Jesus in faith. But we have to use it correctly. 
because we will see the miracles of God in our life. So friends, the four powerful weapons of attack, which is, number one, the Word of God. Secondly, the supernatural tongues that we have. Number three, the blood of Jesus. And number four, the name of Jesus. So all these are the weapons that we have against the devil. It's against the devil of what we're going to do. So how do we use them to launch the attack? How to do it? Right now, in Psalms 8, verse 1 to 2, Psalms 8, verse 1 to 2, the Bible says, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who has set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Verse 2, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how excellent is your name. Uh, okay, it's the same one. Alright, so there is one channel for launching all super, supernatural weapons. And what is the channel? Which is our mouth. Your mouth is very powerful. That's why the Bible says everything, whether life and death, is from our tongue. So whether your tongue is going to speak good things or bad things, it's from your tongue. Your tongue can destroy someone's life. So your tongue is very, very important. The mouth that you speak. What is the, what is the power that propels a weapon to strike the target? The answer is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works through you. Alright? Two persons can say this. Both, two person can both say, Satan, I rebuke you. When one says it, nothing happens. The other one who says it, there's power. Signs and wonders that follow. Why? Why is that so? What is the difference? The difference is not in the word. It is in the power of the word. Someone who say, because nothing happens. Because the person is not right in the spirit. Another person who says, boom, healing takes place. Deliverance happens. Everything, so many things. Miracles begin to happen. Because the word that's inside you. It is, the, it is not what the, what, what the person says. It is the power that's in it. So friends, there are four main ways our mouth can launch this attack. Firstly, number one is through prayer. If you want your mouth to be strong in the spirit, you need to pray all the time. Firstly, prayer. Secondly, is praising the Lord. Praise. Thirdly, is preaching the word. Okay, thirdly, is preaching the word. So when you preach the word of God, we are launching the word as a powerful weapon against Satan's kingdom. Powerful. So therefore, we must always expect our preaching to pull down strongholds, to pull down, to produce miraculous results all the time. Our mouth is so important and so spiritual that every time you speak, heavens come down. In a cell group, in a church, you just need to say, you know, sometimes we don't feel presence and all you, but you need to speak and say, the, the Lord is here. You just speak in a spiritual realm, the Lord will come. You must speak through your mouth to believe that Jesus is here. Everywhere, everywhere you go. You know, as you wake up in the morning, as you pray, you need to tell Holy Spirit, let's go. Remember, Holy Spirit is your best friend. Holy Spirit, let's go. Wake up in the morning, hi Holy Spirit, good morning Holy Spirit. Every time you walk, come Holy Spirit, let's go together. When you're at work, Holy Spirit, let's go, help me. Talk to the Holy Spirit all the time because the Holy Spirit is your friend. He is the Lord. He is there with you. Every one of us has the Holy Spirit in us. So bring Him along everywhere you go. Amen? So that He can help you to solve problems in your life. When you have problems, don't go to your leader or pastor first. Go to the Lord. Go and tell the Holy Spirit, help me first. Unless you cannot hear the Holy Spirit. Then that's where you go to the second channel, to your pastor or your leader. So always get the Lord to help you first. One word from God is better from anywhere, anybody else. One word. And one revelation and encounter from God, it will change your life totally. So learn to go towards the Lord every single time. Amen? Friends, number four. Personal, your personal testimony. Alright, your personal testimony is very important. So four things that we can launch this attack. Firstly, prayer. Secondly, praise. Third, preaching. And fourthly, personal testimony. Amen? Personal testimony. So in conclusion, friends, there are five defensive parts to the armor of God. Remember the five things that we learned? The five armor. So number one, the, gird, the girdle of 
Okay, let's speak together. Are you there? The girdle of truth. Secondly, the breastplate of? Thirdly, the shoes of the? Yes, preparation of the gospel of peace. Number four, the shoe of? And five, the helmet of? Amen. Of course, we know that the word of God is a sword. But what can the word of God do? The four powerful weapons of attack. Firstly, number one is the? Word of God. Number two? Supernatural tongues. Number three? Number four? Amen. So all these are spiritual attack. We need to attack the devil with all these words. So you need to learn the word. You need to read the word. You need to speak in tongues. You need to speak like never before and speak in strong. Strong tongues. Friends, the four ways that we can launch the attack. Firstly, number one is true. Number two, true. Number three, true. And number four, true. And all God's people say, can we get the musicians to come out right now? Let's give Jesus a big clap. Hallelujah. So friends, we need to know there's a spiritual warfare that's happening all the time. Don't let the devil rest because the devil can never rest. Don't have this mindset to think the devil is resting. The devil will not rest because the devil doesn't even want you to step into the church. So we must hold up this spiritual attack. The warfare that's had with us. And let's pray like never before. Let's pray in the mighty name. That's why I, 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 got, I got James to, to do this, to sing this song, Battle Belongs. Because every battle we fight, it belongs to the Lord. It belongs to the Lord. You know, some of us, maybe we are fighting the battle. Right now, nobody knows. Maybe you are someone who is very quiet that you don't say. But the Lord knows you. That this battle you are fighting is not against the flesh, the flesh and blood. It's against the principality of darkness. That you know, yes, you may come up. That you know that whatever you are doing, that the Lord is there for you. He has redeemed you totally from every single thing that you have. He has redeemed your sin totally. So to, today, as we go on, you know, we need to take away. We need to fight the battle. We need to tell ourselves that there is a spiritual warfare that's happening. Amen? Especially right now, you are doing Bible study. You are six months of Bible study. Every month you are here. And I know some of you, you even stay in a church or stay somewhere here because you come from far away and uh, today we have to come at 8 a.m. So you, you came here all the way for what? It's to really know the Word. And I, and I guarantee you, the devil is unhappy about it. Especially when I know that you are building a building that thinks so. Yeah? That building can see 5,000 capacity. 5,000. The devil is shaking right now. Because you are doing the Bible study right now, you are going to be the armor barrier for, for bishop. You are going to be the one that's fighting the battle. Let's give Jesus a big clap. Amen? And I believe after, after your whole blocks of Bible study, you are going back to your different churches. And when you go back, you're going to be great armor barrier for your church, for your pastor. You're going to do Bible study with every single new members. And I tell you, it's going to get stronger and stronger. Revelations. No, re revival is going to come. And you need to know revival is going to come not only here in your church as well. Every part, any part that you are in and you are involved, revival is going to happen. Amen? And that is where we need to always prepare this armor together. So let's be ready to fight the battle all the time. And that's why I want to be part of it. I told Pastor Kenneth, I want to be part in Philippines. I was telling Bishop, Bishop Ted that a few years ago, before COVID, that this prophet who came to our church, he went to Bible school. And, he, and he, when he was prophesying in the Bible school, he did not, initially it was different nationality who came out. Suddenly he heard from the Lord. And he asked all the Filipinos to come. He put, he put the Vietnamese and the Myanmarese all aside. He asked the Filipino to come out. And he prophesied. He says, he says the Lord told him that revival is not going to happen in Vietnam. The next revival is not going to happen in Myanmar. The next revival is going to happen in Philippines. Let's give God a big clap. It is going to happen. It is happening. For the last seven years, I've been in and out of Bacalod. I've been in and out of Novaliches in Laguna, in different places, I see so many people that they came to the Lord every single time. At the, at, at the clip of the fingers, people start to come and come in the presence of the Lord. So friends, revival is happening. If you want to be part of it, you need to be excited to be part of it. 
Because God can use anybody and any church. Friends, if you want your church to be involved in a revival, you need to take up the armour. You need to say, Lord, send us. Let me do it. Let me do it. That's why I told Pastor, I said, Pastor, I want to be involved in Philippines because I want to rub shoulders with the Filipinos. <laughs> I want to say one day when I got to heaven, say, you know, God will tell me, good and faithful servant, you are part of the revival because you are with the Filipino. That's why I tell, my, I, I tell people around me, I'm a Singapinoy. <laughs> I want to be part of the revival because I'm believing revival is happening. Every part of Philippines, I see many churches, the people are coming to the Lord. The young people are coming. Emerge starts happening everywhere. The youth are all coming. So friends, let's be part of this exciting race that God has placed in you. Amen? God has placed Philippines for a purpose like this. The next revival is going to happen here in the Philippines. And all of God's people say, Amen. Let's stand on our feet right now. Let's pray right now. Let's pray, let's pray. Let's pray like never before. Let's have this spiritual warfare in the mighty name. Let's sing together. Oh my God. 
Today, I'm going to ask for this order call because without the tongues, there's no spiritual warfare at all. That you cannot fight against the devil. So right here, right now, with your own decision, with a raise of hands, I wonder how many of you that you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit again so that you can use the tongues as a spiritual warfare for you. I'm going to count to three right now. If it's you, I want you to raise up your hands. If you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, today is a day when you know that revival is going to happen. You want to be part of it. That you want the tongues to be so strong in the Spirit that every time you speak, revival happens. Every time you speak, the presence of God comes. At the count of three, I want you to raise up your hands. One, two, three. Right now, raise up your hands. Oh, Do me one favor before we end the session. I want you to come out of your, of, of your chair right now. Come to the front. And today we want to baptize in the Holy Spirit again. Let's not bother about people beside you. Do not even need to ask permission. You come out right now to be baptized in the Holy Spirit again. Right now, I'm going to count to three. You walk out of the feet as we're going to sing this song. One, two, three. If you are raised up your hands. Come out right here, right now, come out. If you are raise our hands to be baptized again, come out. Do not be shy. Oh, let's sing the song. I'm waiting for you to come out. Oh, yes. Oh, hallelujah. Let's sing the song. Just come out. Those that are standing right in front here, I want to repeat this prayer after me. All of you here at the back, if you are not out, I want you to echo after me as well. Ready? 
I want you to pray together with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you. Today, I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I want to be strong in my tongues. That today, I can use the tongues as a spiritual warfare to come against Satan. In the mighty name, Holy Spirit, you come and baptize me. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. I want you to speak in tongues right now. Speak from your belly. Speak, speak, speak like never before. From your belly, from your belly. Speak, speak, speak. Let it flow from your belly right now. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's come into the spirit. All of us here, even at the back, let's sing in tongues. Let's sing a love song to God. Oh, let's sing in tongues. Shiriyo, Shiriyarabaho, Riyarabahe, Shiriyo, Riyarabaho, Riyarabahe, Riyarabaho. Spirit speaking to you. Some of you here that came out, that you are so on fire for God. You have done so much. And every time you pray, you feel that nothing is happening. But today, I sense the Holy Spirit is telling you that they do not despise your new beginning. Do not despise what you are doing for Him. Even though you may not hear from Him, he has reached out to heaven that the Lord knows what your prayer is. That the prayer that you have been praying for, it will come to pass. Today, God wants you to keep on trusting Him. Keep on following Him. Because the day of the breakthrough will come. Will come. That your prayer will come to pass because the Word says that He will grant you the desires of your heart. Search no more. Search no more. Because the Lord hears your prayer. Today, God wants to affirm you and assure you that He is the Lord that is alive. He is there for you every single time as you cry out to Him. He has not forsaken you. He has not left you in the lurch. He is watching over you in the mighty. Receive it right now. Oh, 
Thank you, Jesus. And when I fall Come on, last time. Shall we give Jesus a big clap? Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, those who have come out, you need to keep on speaking everywhere you go. Keep on speaking in tongues. So that your tongue, your language will be so great. So every time you'll be so fluent. And I tell you, you'll be like never before. Sing to the Lord a love song. You know, without the music, you also can still sing to the Lord. Amen. All right, shall we give these people a big clap? You may go back to your seat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 So thank you very much. And yeah, okay. I, uh, can, 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 we, can we, before we go, right? I want to teach you all a dance. Deep price out. Okay, we have a dance. Uh, my, 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 what is that? My mission mate, can you come out? Shall we dance the deep price out? You know, I'm, amen. I, I know many of you are here. If I can dance, you can dance too. All right, so you follow my step. That's where I teach all the churches.
praise. Hallelujah.